Hey, are you here? That's the question we ask you on The Paul Leslie Hour. Welcome to episode number 1009. We're joined for a second time by famed film producer Frank Marshall. Frank's coming on to talk about the record album he co-produced from legendary trumpeters and vocalists Chet Baker and Jack Sheldon, entitled In Perfect Harmony, The Lost Album. Subscribe and like on YouTube for greater content. And with that, hey, everybody, it's time for Frank Marshall! Hey. Hey, hey. Hey, Paul. Cool. How's it going? It's going well, thanks. It's a beautiful day here in uh, Los Angeles, so uh, I can't complain. Well, I like to hear that. It's great to welcome you back. For all the people out there, Frank Marshall is a film producer director, musician, and now you can add record producer to that list. I'm going to hold this up for everybody out there. Oh, you Look have that. that. I don't have one myself. That's beautiful. Well, I feel special now, I, I have to admit. <laughs> this is Chet Baker and Jack Sheldon in Perfect Harmony, the Lost Album, which is coming out on April 20th, the record version, that is. And uh, it's a, a very exciting thing. I, I'm hoping you can tell us Chet Baker and Jack Sheldon are unique in a lot of ways. Both trumpet players, both singers, both atypical kind of singers. Yep. And um, it's an interesting record. So tell us, how did this come to be as far as you know? Well, <clears throat> the best of my recollection, Paul, is, um, well, I, let's back up a little. I grew up in a musical family. My dad was a jazz guitarist, and we always had music around the house and people playing, et cetera, et cetera. And Jack Sheldon was one of his best friends. And um, they just loved to play music together, all these guys in sort of the West Coast jazz era of the 60s and the 70s. And we moved down to Newport Beach, um, and uh, I was still in high school at Newport Harbor High School. And in 1964, I believe it was, my senior year, we even had an assembly where we had Johnny Mercer, Jack Sheldon, Howard Roberts, Frank Rossellino, Shelley Mann on drums. That was at my high school assembly. So that's the kind of music that I had uh, growing up, uh, surrounding me all the time. Um, and uh, all of these musicians, they just love to play. They love to play together. They didn't really care whether they made any money. They didn't care about albums. They just love to play. And, yeah. and Chet Baker and, and Jack Sheldon were friends. And uh, in, I believe it was 1966, up in Sausalino, Chet had... Chet was sort of in the dark side of jazz music, hmm. um, got in a lot of trouble. There's a lot of drugs, and even though he's an incredible musician, uh, he was in that other sort of, I call the other side of jazz. And he got in a fight outside of a, a club where my dad and Jack Sheldon played a lot called the Trident up there. Uh, and he, somebody hit him in the mouth and broke his teeth. And he didn't play for a long time. And um, and I guess one of the things that that Jack Sheldon did as a friend, the great thing about this time, Paul, was everybody was friends. They supported each other. They got together. They loved to play. And evidently, Jack Sheldon said, look, you know, you need to come back. And they they went and, and met with another friend of great friend of my dad's, a studio trumpet player named Yuan Racy. Um, who they sort of revered, and they talked to you, Yuan, about how Jack, uh, sorry, how Je Chet Baker might come back, and Yuan suggested just having a bigger mouthpiece because his he had dentures, 
he had to learn how to play again. And, and both of these guys, Jack and Chet, had unique sounds. Hmm. They played with a unique sound, which you hear on the album. They also had unique singing styles, where Chet Baker was very quiet and soft. Jack Sheldon was boisterous and loud. And, and so um, their collaboration together was pretty amazing on this. And I think that, that Jack Sheldon was just trying to coax Chet back into playing and, and making albums. And um, my dad had uh, gone into business with a fellow named Hank Quinn, who also lived, we lived on Lido Isle uh, with Johnny Mercer. Wow. Um, no, it's when I think about this, it's all pretty incredible. Um, and and the Quins lived down uh, five or six streets from us, and there were no recording studios in Orange County. Kind of amazing back in the, in the seventies. And Hank Quinn decided to put one in up in Tustin, which was a sort of new community. And he went to a mini mar, uh, mall, and he built this studio called United Audio and a lot of people started recording there. And, you know, in those days you went and made demos if you had a folk group or a rock and roll group. And my dad used it a lot. And he actually, he and Jack Sheldon did uh, an album there called Freaky Friday, which is another, not lost tape, it's out. You can, it's a CD, it's pretty crazy. It shows you their sense of humor. Um, and that's where they coaxed um, Chet Baker to come back and start playing again. And according to the jazz detective, uh, Zeb Feldman, who, who helped me produce this album, um, it's a year or two before the official comeback for Chet Baker. Um, so it's really a lost album uh, that I'm so thrilled to be able to now let everybody hear. So it's truly a musical artifact unearthed, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I said in the liner notes that my dad um, had, had planned to take it out and, and sell it, but uh, unfortunately had a sudden heart attack uh, less than a year after they made the album. And it kind of got stuck in a box in our garage on Lido Isle. And, you know, I kind of unearthed it of several years ago. And then um, a musicologist and a great music producer, uh, Jeff Pollack, who's also a producer on this, um, he encouraged me to, you know, unearth it and get it out there. And I, I actually didn't even know who had played on it, except for my dad, uh, Jack and, and Chet. And then so we had to do a little digging to find out who the other musicians were, which it turns out we're all kind of part of what I call the West Coast jazz era. And then they all played at our house uh, a lot. Dave Frischberg, Joe Mondragon, who all the guys called the Dragon and Nick Ciroli on drums, but they were always around. And so it was great now to be able to um, get this one out so people can hear it. So the very first time that you heard this tape in whatever state it was in, what was going through your head? Uh, friendship hmm. was going through my head because I'd say Jack Sheldon was my dad's best friend. And all, all these musicians back then just wanted to play together, just wanted to hang and create music and laugh and party hard they, they lived hard lives but it was all about the music and and their friendships i mean the fact that all these guys would come down and play at my high school for an assembly that's that's friendships they, they weren't getting paid they wanted to spread jazz they wanted to listen to music and i think that uh, they were so supportive of each other and that's what you see here with jack supporting chet to get back in to what he loved to do which was make music and, and record albums. So I think that's when, when I heard this, I felt the love between all of these guys. Hmm. Uh, it, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, a hip thing back then, but they loved each other. 
They love to be together. They love to play together. So that's when I first heard this album, that's what I felt shown through. I've always been kind of a, a, a digger. And, uh, you know, I'm the kind of person that I read the liner notes. I, I look at the little details and looking Don't at these names. Them? Don't you miss liner notes? I absolutely do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, it matters who wrote a song, who played on this. Dave Frischberg, one of the more interesting people in music, is on this album. But I'm hoping you can tell us about Jack Marshall, your father. You've been talking a little bit about him, but what kind of guy was he? Um, he was the kindest, gener most generous dad you could ever have. He loved his kids. He loved music. And we grew up in a musical household. There was music all the time, everywhere. He had an incredible sense of humor, which got him through. I mean, if you ask anybody who knew him or played with him, it was his sense of humor. He and and it could have been dark humor as well, <laughs> uh, but he made everybody laugh and he made everybody feel comfortable. And he was this kind of savant with being able to uh, transfer what was in his head musically onto music paper. And I used to watch him at home. He would have a big sheet of yellow music paper and down the side were violins, bass, trumpets, clarinets, drums. And he would play a chord with his left hand and write each bar. He could hear in his head what the violin sounded like, what the trumpet sounded like. And he would write and arrange and do these arrangements across that sheet. It was just miraculous. And so he had a real gift and he had a gift of bringing people together. These people would always be at our house. Um, he, he loved to come up here, to, he called it up to town and uh, play at Dante's. And he created guitar night at Dante's where the best jazz guitarists in the world would come and play for scale because they loved to play. Hmm. And so that was my dad. He, uh, he started, um, he grew up in Kansas. He played the banjo in Kansas uh, as a kid and was um, given a contract with MCA. I like to think Lou Wasserman did this, so, but who knows, but um, to play on the radio, sing and play on the radio when he's 14. So the entire family moved to Hollywood. It's why I'm here. He went to Hollywood High. And uh, then he was the youngest uh, member of the Johnny Green Orchestra uh, at MGM. He played the guitar. He's in the, the, the videos that they have of the Jubilee Orchestra. Um, and then he you know, became a session player because um, he could read music. That was the thing. He learned how to read music. He learned his 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 lessons to me or his advice to me was if you're going to play guitar learn to play classical guitar first because hmm. then you can read and then you can play chords and you have the dexterity in your hands and then if you want to go jazz or rock or folk you can do them all so uh, and then he started arranging and writing and that's when he got a uh he was contracted by capitol records uh, dave cavanaugh and that's when he discovered jack sheldon he brought Howard Roberts in. He loved to arrange and pick these songs and produce these albums. And then he started writing for TV. Uh, his most famous uh, series was The Munsters, <laughs> uh, which still lasts till today. You know, it's you hear it. It's even sampled by. Uh, uh, oh, uh, what's it called? There was a, a, a rap group. Uh, oh gosh, I, I can't think of it. Who sampled part of the Munsters? <laughs> so how about that, yeah. How about that? Still today, his music lives on. So uh, I was really proud of him. He, he went way too early, but he lives on in my heart. Well said. Well, it, it's sometimes hard to pick favorites. So sometimes it's uh, sorry, Fallout Boys. Fallout, Fallout Boys. Boys. Okay. Yeah, that was yeah. the group. That's the group with the Munsters. So they, they did kind of an homage. And it was great because, you know, we got some of the publishing. 
Oh, nice. <laughs> Good for the family. <laughs> right, right. So could you possibly pick a favorite track from this this record coming out? I'll, I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. Okay. Well, I, uh, I have two, actually. One's Jack Sheldon, Historia de Un Amor. I think his singing and his solo on, on that track is incredible. And um, for Jet, for Chet, it's This Can't Be Love. Okay. He does some great stuff in there, but you know, they're, they're so unique, these two guys together. It's kind of amazing, don't you think? Oh, definitely. There, yeah. There's a, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe this is an obvious statement. There's a difference, but there's a great commonality between the two of them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They, they somehow, they have distinctive sounds, both in their playing and their singing. Right. But somehow they blend together. Yeah, somehow. Yeah. And and it, it's a, a magic moment that would possibly be just sitting there in a box, but by a miracle. A miracle. Yeah, it's a, it's a miracle. And, and again, it's, I, I think there's been kind of a renaissance in jazz. Um where people want to hear this stuff and you know we've got vinyl back again i mean i'm thrilled yeah <laughs> this is on vinyl and you know what a way to celebrate record day yeah then to have this album come out on vinyl so it's pretty fantastic oh yeah i i've been i've been playing this more than a few times uh into the wee small hours of the morning <laughs> uh i pride wait, my wait what's your favorite okay well I pride myself on knowing my great American songbook. And so I was, I was listening. I, I didn't look at the song titles and I thought, now what is this one? There's one song on there that I'm pretty sure most people haven't heard Too blue. I think it's a beautiful song and I had never heard it before. Yeah. That, well, that's the other interesting thing about the choices of these songs. It really reminds me of my childhood and growing up because there's a bossa nova in there. You know, bossa nova was new in the 60s. So once I love is in there, um, I'm old fashioned. You know, yeah. come on, that's a stand. There are these standards. You fascinate me so, you know, there's a Johnny Mercer represented in there, you know. Um, it, it is kind of an American songbook, but you're right. Two Blue was, was one that they, you know, they picked these songs. So, yeah. It was one of, you know, those are the songs they would play in their sets at these jazz clubs, I guess, because they loved the way they were constructed. Right. And Two Blue is a Jack Sheldon composition. And so yep. you, you always know when something's a good song, when a, a composer says, OK, I'm going to be alongside This Can't Be Love. I'm going to be alongside I'm Old Fashioned. It's, you know, but it's yeah. a great song for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's smiling down right now on you for that one. <laughs> well, speaking of of smiling down, you had a uh, a unique experience recently. You were on stage at the Hollywood Bowl. I was. Last what Thursday. was that like? It was an incredible moment. Um, kind of surreal when I think back on it. Um, celebration of my best friend Jimmy Buffett. Um, and it was a fitting and wonderful celebration of his life. When you, when you see the eclectic group of people standing on that stage, there's there, somewhere online, somebody uh, on their iPhone panned the stage. Hmm. And when you look who's up there on Margaritaville, which is what I was up there uh, doing, it's amazing. Uh, the the different uh, folks that he touched and felt they were his friends. I mean, this is these were real friendships, and you know you've got everybody from Snoop Dogg to Pitbull to Paul McCartney to Jackson Brown to um, uh, Cheryl Crow to you know you just you see plus his his band you just see the breath of musicality and the people he touched in, in the most unique and best way. He just liked 
to live and love life. Brandy Carlisle, you know, I, I, it was an amazing night. It was an amazing night. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't there, but I heard the Brandy Carlisle version of Tin Cup Chalice. And man, that was just beautiful. <laughs> what a great song. And that's the thing that goes a lot of times unrecognized. What a great songwriter he was. Right. What a great storyteller, you know, and um, Zach Brown, you know, Dave Grohl. <laughs> yeah. You know, how do you get all these people together? Only Jimmy Buffett could have done it. Yeah. And something that I think is interesting, you know, a lot of people have him pigeonholed as a, a folk artist or folk rock, but I always thought that he did such a phenomenal job, speaking of standards, of things like Stars Fell on Alabama, Slow Boat to China, White Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, he, you know, and and his covers of other people's, he, you know, um, Southern Cross, um, uh, Brown Eyed Girl, you know, and those were his standards as well. He appreciated other musicians and, and writers. And uh, yeah, it's, he was one of a kind, literally. Well said, well said. So working our way back to this, this record that's coming out, uh, there's a lot of uh, emotion and there's a lot of cerebral things about it too. What do you hope that somebody gets out of the experience of listening? What do you hope that they keep in mind and in heart for that matter? I think that I hope that people understand what friendship is about and that the generosity of these two really superstars trading off with each other and Jack Sheldon encouraging, encouraging Chet to come back and giving him a way to do it. Uh, it's in the notes, but I, I, I'm sure he said, hey, Chetty, you only have to play on half this album. You know, I'll play on the other half. So there was a real love of all of these musicians that I grew up with in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. And I think that this is a perfect example of that. Is there a Frank Marshall theme song? Is there a song that if you had to pick that would describe you, could you pick one? Not just if any song in the world. Any song? Well, that's that's quite a task. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I also have a very eclectic uh, taste for music. Uh, I do like the standards. I this is the other thing in our household. There were these standards, you know. Frank Sinatra. My my dad loved Sinatra. Dad and mom. My mom was musical, played the piano as well. Um, so we had all of this great classical music. We had the great standards playing all the time. Um, you know, is there a song for me? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, Paul. That's a <laughs> tough one. I'd have to really think about it. I like them all. You know, it's, pick your, your favorite child. Tough. Well, I'll tell you, whenever I see the name Frank Marshall, I'm – always going to think about one of my all-time favorite songs and also one of my all-time favorite movies. I'll always think of Paper Moon. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, you know, when they ask me that question, what movie is your favorite? That's one of the, maybe one of the top two. That movie, the entire experience, the making of the movie was fantastic. The result, the, the movie itself was fantastic. Um, and you can't ask for more than that. And that song, you're right, that, that's one of the greats, that song. Um, and, and for me, a real, you know, sort of, that's where I really fell in love. I, I was in love with movies, but th that one, we were just this little band of gypsies going across Kansas into Missouri, making this movie. <laughs> and it was so fun and it was, it was just so rewarding. And, you know, the performance of Tatum and, and her dad, Ryan. Um, and of course, I had Peter and Bogdanovich and Polly Platt, my two mentors with me. They weren't together, but we were working together. So it was just a fantastic experience. And you're right. 
It was based around that song. Um, yeah. These standards, you know, um, I'm old fashioned. Maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's who I am. <laughs> Frank, what is your drink of choice? My drink of choice is Don Julio 1942, which um, on the rocks with a lime, which was also Jimmy Buffett's favorite drink. Oh, how about that? <laughs> well, everybody out there, Chet Baker and Jack Sheldon in perfect harmony, the lost album on the Jazz Detective label. You need to pick it up, folks. It's it's really a, a beautiful thing. And it's also going to be coming out on CD uh, on April 26th. So pick it up, folks. <laughs> and Frank Marshall, it's great to spend time with you. Thanks, Paul. I look forward to doing it again. We'll We'll find another album, right? That's right. That's right. Well, I will tell you, I will be, uh, there's a great, great singer songwriter. He lives in San Clemente, California. And oh. this summer I'm going to be traveling out. So it's a small world. Who knows? Well, let me know. I'm here. I'm, I'm only an hour away from San Clemente. Maybe okay. <laughs> All right. Well, sir, yeah, congratulations on unearthing this great, great record. Thanks so much, Paul. Great to chat with you. Take Thank care. you, sir. Okay. Till next time. Bye-bye. You know, Bye -bye. the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by people like you, listeners, viewers. Please go to thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do when you're there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who contributes. Performance of The Entertainer intro song by John Primerano. And, of course, this is your announcer speaking. See you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.